biomechanical systems, which was mentioned, uh, to create these ideas to come to fruition in Sri Lanka. And, uh, and we had a lot of things about how things have uh, uh, happened in the country. But I think from internally, we will feel that we may have ideas, but we are not in a position sometimes to uh, execute these ideas. So I really thank the organizers for the invitation extended. Uh, but this is a sentence that uh, is used in Korean advancement of science, which is very applicable for us, which is science plus creativity gives you answers plus advancement. So let us use science and in the terms process in, and also advanced science. But what happens is, is our, our, our curiosity and our creativity and then in turn uh, will provide us with the answers and advancement. An advancement to the nation, answers to our problems, as well as solutions, as well as moving our nation forward. Because in the current context, we do have to adapt as well to the ongoing globalization, the issues, and we should not play second fiddle to that situation. We should be a masters of our own destiny. And I think sometimes today what we see is we are not masters of our destiny. We are being we have been governed by the outside and we just fall prey at times. So let us even use science for that, for our betterment. Um, okay. So it's an imperative that we have to look at research, we have to look at applied research, and sometimes the word science is disappearing from the lexicon of Sri Lankan uh, administration. Uh, it's not there, right? And applied research, and then you have innovation and protection and intellectual property rights. It was mentioned about the um, the intellectual property of music, the composing, and then all that, how you uh, have to generate those rights and benefit from it. Uh, and as a result, we can generate wealth to the nation. And today our means of generating wealth to the nation is unfortunately not in through this process. And as a result, we are not actually generating real wealth. We do have access to some fleeting wealth and it's not giving substance to the nation. Right, so let's look at real wealth through research and innovation. And let us not forget basic research in the process too. Because what we see today, very critical in the need for this diversity, need for bringing creativity into the equation, is if you look at our export import figures, the curves, it's, it's really a problem. And in the, the uh, now, in the kind of last few months, we are seeing it really dramatically perhaps. But this has been the nature. This has been the nature and we are not seeing a deviation from it. Um, what we are bringing in is much more than what we get as a result of what we send out. It's a very simple equation. The exports generate much less than what we spend on our imports. The essential equation from a scientific way is that what we like what others produce, others don't like what we produce. Very simple. And what we have to send today are pure commodities. And what we bring in are very expensive stuff. And how many nuts can equal one vehicle? Right, so you see the picture. And last few fun, two months, we are actually breaking records in terms of our vehicle imports. And uh, interestingly, in the month of June, a uh, couple of months, export expenditure for vehicles actually was much, much more than the entire coconut ex uh, the exports, right? So we can, um, you, you see the power of, or the lack of power of commodities in terms of a nation's wealth generation. We just cannot do this approach anymore, right? We really need to think. The gap is really getting widened, and we need to put science into the action and to look at how do we really uh, do this. So this is a situation, and when we are looking at uh, the diversification or the, the industry, the need, the manufacturing segment. Uh, when I saw this at the, the summit before, 2014, you don't see the imagination coming in. You really don't see imagination because what you saw in the 2020 GDP for $20 billion in export income for plan for 2020, and now we talk about $50 billion. And uh, when you see the industry in that uh, segment and the agriculture, we really seems to be looking at doing the same thing. 
we are not really adding uh, changes. We don't seem to understand the change, the diversification that is necessary really to bring stability and the strength to the, the process. So you have had things like oil exploration and so on, oil coming in because of the exploration. Now, it's not the exploration that will bring revenue. It's the industry that subsequently has to follow, right? And how do you drive that fast? So purely on exploration in 2020, you're not going to get anywhere. So this is really a very, very narrow description and um, of what we, I think from an economics point, you really should see countries migrating from one technology base to another technology base or to a different technology mix as it progresses. And that's how uh, we have seen it in other places and we should really observe that here too. And unfortunately, we are not factoring that plan. And as a result, um, we, don't, we may not see in time to come that export picture changing. And unless we see that change, we will have a problem with balance in the trade act. Because we know the balance today is being done through the, the inward remittances of the labor, which is seven billion. So that's a huge um, uh, support for the uh, correcting this imbalance, which is of course not counted either in exports or imports, even though that's a human export. Right? So we need to look at a different paradigm, because that's what the science is about. right? Uh, sometimes economics may say go for the service-based economics, saying that the world has moved on to services, and it's the services that will count, and that is what we should be strengthening. But unfortunately, services alone won't give that economic strength, the, the resilience that an economy needs. Service will you get some time, and it's very fickle, and things can change. So why not we look at uh, the combination of knowledge-based economics and the resource-based economics? So why not we add knowledge to the resources that we have? Because as a nation, we are really endowed with our resources, but what we are not doing is we are not factoring the knowledge. We are not even pursuing knowledge from it and uh, being creative with our resources, and that's why the commodity mindset so it's time we look at how do we bring from each of the disciplines, each of the disciplines, and from multidisciplinary to interdisciplinary, working together, and that's probably a theme that I would like to stress too, that uh, bringing these two together to look at how do you grow to get from the economy to grow with that kind of mindset. Right? We can always think, now I put on the resource base a coconut, I put from the knowledge base the storage, right? which the humble carbon can do. But at the moment, we are still thinking of purifying the carbon and still sending the carbon out. Whereas the world is looking at energy storage as a bit, uh, it will be a next big step uh, in technology, right? It's a very, it will be a useful thing because we almost think of going from an AC system to a DC system, alternating current to direct current, because most of the devices are getting transformed, right? And uh, the batteries are going to play a huge role, and we see that a battery is being used and supercapacitors, etc. So that carbon can do. So look at a coconut in a fresh, in a different way. And uh, combining that, we should be able to make transformation. Now each of the resources, we can think like that. So, next, please. so again, the same thing we see with tea, right? Today when we talk about the tea, we are still talking about that big advertisement to come along and helping us to change the game. When are we going to get this big advertisement so people will jump in to drink more tea and hoping that the income will go on. We are on to about 1.25 billion on the tea trade and the global uh, value for tea or the drinks will be in about 12 billion. And we are going to try to target that. What we know is if you are talking about a commodity mindset and people drinking more tea, we do have a land issue, right? We just have to look at the growth area and then the conversion. And we know our replanting has been pretty poor too in our tea estates. So why not we look at the value addition? That is again bringing extra knowledge into the, the equation. So you look at products that are out there. We find we look at the global picture today. We are not in the top 25 universities and research places where the research on tea is being conducted. So that shows the disparity, the, the huge gulf that exists between the need for research and innovation into the trade system, into a resource that we are having. Is China and Japan is on the top on the tea in terms of research. Uh, even though we are a big tea uh, producing country and we expect tea to, to, to support our economy, 
the research input or the support to research and to get it back into the economy has been pretty poor. So you analyze the data, the top 25 Sri Lanka doesn't figure. And that's a big gap. So whereas when you see the products like the, the green teas and so on, that has been extracts and so on, those are very high value added. And that's not within that 12 billion range. We are into a biotechnology or the nutraceuticals. And so those, those market segments are much, much larger than what you're talking about with the pure drinking tea. It's time to think along those directions and to say, okay, this is the roadmap and this roadmap we need to traverse. And that's where the science has to come in, right? You need to science to integrate into plan. So the next one, uh, if you just take, if you take your humble ceiling fan or the pedestal fan, it's very interesting. Things that are coming from Japan, right? If you look into the, we don't normally read the service manual. And if you look at that, you will find, click again, please. You will find green tea catechin. So it's interesting. Right? Your extract is now coating, and these are result, uh, solutions to indoor air quality. We have a big problem. We stay more in indoors, and with our carpets and things like that, it doesn't get all the time corrected. You may apply perfume on it, but you don't correct the basic problem sometimes. Right? You try to do a little bit of a good smell and then to cover up the, the bad smell. And um, so IAQ, indoor air quality, is a big thing. So we have, we have now these fans coming out with catechin. Uh, used in for IAQ. So you can see the, the uh, what you see as normal ordinary tea and knowing what's in there is now getting translated or getting into integrated into different products and the markets are so different. And as a major player in tea, we just don't have never put our sights on these areas. And that is a deficiency. That is where the knowledge base has to come in. right? And that's what we should be pushing. So to go on like that, the environment is ecosystem is really being challenged. There's no question about it. So we are going to live in interesting times, and some of uh, so it's interesting in a sense, but really challenging times. Uh, the extreme weather events are different. Uh, the numbers are going is increasing, and we see these issues, and the population is exploding. Thanks to science to some extent because we have been able to overcome some of the problems, but the water scarcity, the water needs. 30% more, the food is 50% more, the energy is 50% more by 2030, and we are already into 2015 and ending up 2015. So these are figures that went to Rio plus 20, right? So we are talking about the demand for resources by the population is increasing, but we have this one single planet. So we don't have the luxury of 1960s in the development pathway. We have to think very differently in this coming period. And to couple up these extreme weather events, how are to respond? Are we resilient enough? We don't see that resilience, right? We really don't see that resilience, right? Um, and it's very, very important to address. So this is a challenge that is going to be facing in for the next development drive. And uh, the more we have it in, embedded in the planning is very important for our nation. Um, so science has always given these answers. That's what the the beauty of science and you can mix the words of the glory of science and the beauty of science and the glory of nature and the beauty of science, nature, right? So in a way, this is interchangeable, but finally probably the nature will take over. Is uh, The nature will take over and science is coming back to respect nature and we see that and that's probably where I will end up with my theme. So the Malthus came up in the early days and said, look, at the rate this population is exploding, he has one linear equation for the, the yield for agriculture products, whereas the population growth was not linear. So when you have a linear equation and exponential growth, and you have an intersection, and he saw these very simple intersections and said, okay, beyond this point, we are going to have a crisis. And as simple as that. Quite logical, but the point was science rose to the fact. And then showed that Malthus was proved wrong. But maybe the Malthus was proved wrong for a time period. Right? So, you have people like Norman Boller coming in, crossing from Hungary. So this is not very theoretical. I'm talking about from a science being very exciting and as scientists and maybe from multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary, how we can learn from each other and produce results that are very important. And Attila mentioned perhaps at the end of the day, just before you die, you can look back and say, look, we did something. Right? So, in that, in that context, I think it's very, very important if you can look back and say, look, we, are, we, we are delivered something, and, and that should be important. So, Bola came from Hungary, 
uh, because of hunger to the United States. And being an agriculturist, uh, he was looking at and this, and he saw this. He came up with um, maybe not the best of the agricultural practices that today the environmentalists would love. Right? The monoculture, extreme, I mean, look at uh, uh, then getting a lot of land under cultivation, putting fertilizer, agrochemicals, and getting the yields up. But he resolved a basic issue. And because of his inputs, the Mexico, and then down to the India, from the Swaminathan group, etc., the Indian Green Revolution, all benefited from his um, the work. And from his science, he cannot get a Nobel Prize, he got the Nobel Peace Prize, right? For the resolving hunger at the time. But it was interesting at the same period, you had the environmentalist movement coming, and uh, like marine biologist Rachel Carson came up with Silent Spring. Because while on one hand, um, you are applying all this fertilizer, then putting this monoculture, and then large tracts of uh, fertilization uh, growth, and then she was coming to think, okay, look, what is happening here? We apply a lot of pesticides and stuff, one day I will wake up to find I will not hear birds chirping. And then she started the ecological movement, right? And the silent spring changed the United States. The same time period, it's interesting. But it's also, um, I mean, so the type of environmental movement, the sensitization that happened in the US has now really caught on also. Uh, because on one side, the science was really screaming ahead, uh, trying to conquer nature. Trying to conquer nature and to give more and more to the people and then to propel the consumerist society or the culture. And that has not yet stopped, right? So we now look at, okay, how do you put sustainable consumption model into the practice? How do you apply breaks into this economy? The very breaks that probably we need because we, the way we look at our number of vehicles exploding, right? So one fine day, we may have to think very quickly, how do we address these issues of, uh, yes, we need mobility, but is the car the solution for mobility? Sooner we address that, uh, it's better for Sri Lanka, I think. Right? Anyway, Rachel Carson at the same time. Uh, so it's a little ironic in my way. She unfortunately died of cancer uh, and uh, at a very young, at a relatively young age, when probably she has so much to contribute. And uh, Norman lived long um, in, the, in his field. So it's some uh, two different segments, but uh, in the same time period, two different ways science contributed. And we are guilty. I mean, we should understand this, right? We are heading for the World Ocean Day, uh, and uh, we are looking at, and Sri Lanka is now being considered to be ranked as the fifth polluter of plastics to the oceans. Um, I think there may be a material balance issue within that equation. But anyway, we have the, the literature suggests we are the fifth nation that is putting plastics into the oceans. And we know these type of pictures that are emanating, and we see the garbage patch of Pacific, and all the stuff that you put into the waterways, it's getting up into the, the, those currents, and then having a tracks of poly, uh, plastics pollution larger than the Texas area of Texas, right? So you see this as pictures today. So we are guilty, and we are proving problematic to the, the animal life. Uh, the, the life, marine life and so on. So we have been equally guilty in terms of social inequity. While some may have raised their heads in consumption, and while we don't take about keeping the tap open uh, for the, the toothbrush, we don't close it sometimes, right? And lots of purified, expensive water is just wasted. Yet, someone, the shower is the animal urine. Right, that child has no shower or a um, system to to get that shower. But if he has the need, but that need is not fulfilled in the proper way, so we have this inequity. So the science has been the capability. We know our capability, but yet we are not uh, really uh, making it equitable. We are not really utilizing our abilities equally. So we have this growing disparity. Right? So that is again a problem of the consumerist nation. So this is why one of the uh, persons said uh, very interestingly, the communism failed because they were hiding the economic truth. Whereas the capitalist system will fail because they are hiding the ecological truth. It's a very strong connection, right? Um, we talk about the economic truth. 
but we relatively less talk about ecological truth. And we think, okay, time will solve that, maybe science will rise up and solve that too, but it's important to understand the ecological truth, the ecological cost, right? And uh, sooner we understand this aspect, it will be really better uh, for the real glory of science and also the, then the nature and the science to coexist to some extent. The humanity should be part of nature rather than the early idea of conquering nature as much as possible. So this is, we owe to many scientists because at one point, and sometimes I, think, I don't think we really pay real service to some of the scientists, probably under extreme conditions. Um, California Irvine was mentioned by Apple, but uh, in the California circuit, Irvine was not very recognized at some point. And then when these two uh, scientists came up with the theory for ozone destruction, uh, the companies went into town with PR at PR. Great public relations exercise of saying distribute, uh, uh, calling the science findings to be wrong, and how can that be? Because there was a huge economic benefit for the the CFCs, the chlorofluorocarbons economy, right? Uh, and then, like scientists like Lovelace, who came up with very instruments to measure the dioxins on the uh, the dioxin meet the meter spectrometers. So these were science inputs who studied very hard and then probably saved the world. Not probably, they saved the world, right? So these graphs that were being taken and who would have looked at studying chlorine, the effect of UV, the chlorine, and the ozone 25 kilometers up, making the instruments, then looking at uh, the, the chemical meteorology, and then coming up with the conclusion something funny is happening up there. And if this continues anymore, the UV is going to come down, and we are going to go uh, the humanity that is racing forward with success after success is going to be no more. And we know the results of Montreal Protocol, etc. So a few scientists works very hard through the science again, showing that, that how the nature's interactions and then preserving us uh, to some extent. Uh, and it's, I think it's very, very important. The science, this, the role that science plays in the sense of curiosity and the creativity element. Okay? And again, Scientists like Keeley in 1950s, who would, in the normal mind, would support somebody to have a meter and a measurement technique to measure carbon dioxide, which is 0.03% of the atmosphere. Right? Now, he was keen, very, very keen, on measuring carbon dioxide. And then he put it, and he had the meter. And this curve is now famous, the Keeley curve. And it is a curve on the northern hemisphere. That these days we are finding we have crossed the 400 ppm carbon dioxide. Now we are continuously crossing 400 ppm, and with the climate we don't know the four, which one is the tipping point. And the world is heading to Paris talks by December, and nations, including Sri Lanka, has not given the commitment. All right, uh, but you're talking about uh, what we need to commit to prevent a two degree rise in temperature by the century end. And what they say is two degrees. Yet a little too much, right? But that's one of the best compromises, probably. Uh, that's what we are talking about. But again, the beauty of science, to some extent, person deciding, I must measure this, and I must set up this observatory, right? And I must continue. And his son is still continuing, anyway, than the Ocean Scripts Institute. So innovation is very, very important, right? From Sri Lankan point, I think we need to inculcate this. So it's very important, the, the basics are very common, but unfortunately we don't really follow this whole story. So getting ideas to research and to commercialization, right? So pure innovation will support any innovation, any commercialization, whereas we probably now have to look at eco-innovation, we are environmentally friendly innovation, right? So trying to move forward with environmentally sensitive ideas and being still creative and then supporting the human growth and the society. Anyway, uh, still the steps are the same, the idea. And idea part is very important because it's a creativity. But creativity comes from curiosity. And unless we are very curious, we question, we ask these things, we won't get to that point and a lot of ideas will not surface. And that's very, very important to inculcate that in, within our wits, getting more ideas and then enabling our systems to support ideas to be executed. That's what I started with. So let's go on uh, next. And even the humble razor. Right? Now this is where something in Sri Lanka is very much lacking because we do not dream big. 
Of course, uh, there may be an element of consumerist economy that I'm talking about by pushing, uh, but um, this is Gillette, right? When King Gillette, when he started his racer, right? Now, who would have thought he would keep innovation after innovation with the racer? And he still, when he exited from the Gillette racer business, giving it to Procter & Gamble, it was like a $60 billion company. And it was all based on innovation. He said, the day I'm going to change, or rather be taken over, when he's maybe a little too tired, he gave up. But he was constantly innovating, right, with the humble racer. And he can say, OK, the world across, my racer is being used. And he got the management or the marketing to work so that it, it has no gender bias. So all are shaving. Right. So that means an uh, opening of the market for another 50% or more of the population. That's marketing. But the point is, it's innovating as well from a business idea. And he was selling the racer sheep, the blade was a business model. So there was business model innovation in him as well. So we need to look at uh, all these innovative elements too. How do we be creative? And that is why the diversity needed, because it doesn't come from one subject. It comes from different subjects. You learn different things, and you synthesize that knowledge, and you come out a winner. Maybe come up with a win. And this is a kind of classic example of a simple thing, but in mixing many things, or, or rather cured quite a few things, but a global empire was built in. All right? So let's go to the next. Time is also premium. And uh, that's what uh, people like Tom Peters would say for the business community. Uh, come up with 10 differentiations to every product or service every 60 days. Now this can apply to a bra uh, the product, service, anywhere. Even in administrative things, we can look at how do we change, because that's one of the things we have not done. We run an archaic system, right? And uh, so this is challenging you. If you want to stay or be relevant, do these differentiations, bring these 10 differentiations, and your time period is 60, right? 60 days. So that means keep thinking, be creative, and always try to do something different. And that means bringing new knowledge or learning from elsewhere, or discussions, bringing something in, and then changing what you have to offer, and excite the people. Of course, there are elements of consumerism as well, but still you can do within, within nature. This is the end point of mine. Right? So human capital deployment, multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary is very important. I know we have anthropologists here. But the Nokia succeeded in India for a simple reason. Right? When you had the mobile phone, it was not simply communication. Right? The phone with the radio, the phone with the light, phone with the screwdriver, or maybe all the other things were the most useful for that one Indian. And so the situation was, okay, it's a communication device, but all the rest of the things that day-to-day -day life were also kind of embedded into that phone. And those insights didn't come from the electronics engineer or the communication specialist. It came from the anthropologist. Right? So having the in-house anthropologist in the team, now, we have a system of, okay, what you can use with this subject? Why do you do this project? I mean, that's not relevant to Sri Lanka. We always go with the argument. Most of the time in our system is, we talked about, if you ever ask a question, what do you need from the graduate with soft skills? Right? So, we always ask somebody to do the talking, but not the working. Right? So, because the working is done by somebody else, we only act as salespeople. So, this is one of the unfortunate points. But remember, we really need to build on the strengths of each other, and that's the way to succeed as well in future, or rather, even present. So this is, again, this creativity. And uh, this happens both in India and US, uh, UK. I'm giving the Indian example that came up in the news. So we have in textile washing and dyeing, you have the problems of wastewater. And uh, the worms, uh, the well, I mean, the, what happens is you, you get the silk and then dye it afterwards. So there was this idea, okay, why not we sprinkle the chemical onto the mulberry leaf and see what happens. And funny enough, it was interesting, the cocoon came up with the color. So you don't have to dye it afterwards because the silk worms were eating and then the cocoons came up with the, right, the color of the dye. So it's a very interesting out-of-the-box scenario, right? Um, so you spread the dye. You get the, the worms to eat and consume, and anyway they die in the process because they are, they are put into hot water. So uh, that's a sad end. But the point is, uh, it's out of the box. We think sequentially, 
We never looked at mixing that sequence and see what may come out if we do this mixing. And you must allow that type of mixing to happen. Organization, don't follow the standard SOP or use the circular, but how do we can bring that fresh thinking and creativity into our organization because in the working life becomes exciting and maybe you get more products also a different way and things that we like. So this is, this is all there, right? And this is synergy between two, uh, two uh, professions. Again, when we meet, what do we discuss? Most of the time, we may discuss politics or some cricket or something like that. I think it's time we discuss each other's areas and how we can learn and embed something from your profession to my product or something what you're doing to my research. And this is a classic example from Imperial where the uh, uh, this is a chemical engineering professor who spoke to a designer who came from a, fellow, a fellowship from Italy, right? Uh, Dr. Michael Torres, the fashion designer. And he was asking the question, please, can we put a... Now, this one was... Uh, engineer was a particle person who has ability to do um, sprays and so on. Can I get a fabric from a can? So the end product was fabric in can. So you can go to the hardware shop and buy the can, spray on the, the fabric. So you have the hats, the wedding dressers, everything coming out from the spray on. So you just spray on. Right? So this is synthesis of a fashion design and engineering. Think how much permutations may happen if we just open up our minds for this type of exchange and practice. And this became in Forbes uh, one of the best startups of the year in 2006 or 5. Right? So Fabric on Cat. You can go to the YouTube and see the, uh, the catwalk from the spray on cat thing. So it's a completely different uh, the garment system. But of course, changing people's minds are different, so uh, it will take some time. At the moment, things have gone to the medical side of it. So, which is different, which is also useful, the same philosophy. So today we are very much having the nature, so we have the idea of uh, top-down development, top-down manufacturing. And we have had very beautiful, very serene, right? The late Jawahar Nahru liked this picture so much, this, uh, the Samadhi Pratima, right? He had it in prison. So that, that is coming, carving out of the creativity of the mind and then the ability skills from a common rock. But that's top down. You still have waste. The nature, of course, has the other. On the, if you have the sperm and the egg, you have the biological specimens coming up from the bottom up, right? All the information is passed, so the, the future society is this biological because the information transferred through that biological process, right? And that understanding is now being embedded. And when you do that process, you have your structure, your waste is different, right? So we have a, we have a situation of switching from a top-down approach to the bottom-up approach which is the challenge, which is that is coming up, but what is much more nature learning and also going to a more towards biology. And again from Sri Lanka, we have a huge problem of engineering and biology going in two different ways. Right, we have, we, we, we disregard two, uh, maybe we go in two different directions and we hardly have any communication. And this is something very seriously flawed because 21st century, there will be strong, strong biology coming in. Right, and it says this is the century of biology. So it's important, you can have from that, you can have Adolf Hitler or Mother Teresa coming out of that bottom-up process, but the point is, the bottom-up process has so much uh, learning to be done, how the nature is organized things. And that learning oh, evolved over millions of years is something that we have to quickly take up in 200 years of industrialization. And that's a big challenge, but it's a, it's a fantastic uh, challenge too. It's quite uh, interesting. So again, I keep on giving examples of how two subjects matter, meet, meet and then interdisciplinary. So look at what this German professor did, right? Helmer on the Bonn University, he's a curator of the zoological botanical gardens. He knew his colleagues were having an electronics, uh, electron, uh, uh, this micro, scanning electron microscope. He took things like lot um, the lotus flower and the salvinia to the cleaners, in a sense, of the microscope. And what he observed, he got trademarks. Right? And that can be world-changing trade um, effects in a sense. Right? So very quickly to go into the lotus, we know this, and we look at the surface, if you look at with the microscope, and then you have the salvinia, we see that every day, around Moratua, next to Moratua, we have Moratua University, we have this 
infested the whole water, and we have been asking from World Bank how to how to clean it up. Right, uh, so our, our way of approach has been a little different. But here is a person who is a curator who takes it up to the electron microscope and observes the structure and see, okay, why this lotus leaf is kept clean? I mean, the leaves are always clean, even under very muddy conditions. So there must be something here. And now I have a tool because my physics colleagues have brought up this, uh, the meters and let me have a look at my biological specimen under that microscope and I see it's fantastic. And the same thing he recently did with Salvinia. And you put salvinia under water and you see this very silvery color. And you would have seen the silvery color a lot of times, but we never pursued why is that silvery color or the optical issue coming through. And then to identify there are air pockets inside, that plant has been specifically built in air pockets to keep it underneath. And so what can I then make use of this habit of air pocket and these surface effects? So we have today, if we can quickly move on. So this is a structure that you would observe, and this is the reason for the leaves be keeping clean. Um, so you have this uh, uh, the clothes that are st uh, that won't actually get wetter. So uh, it's interesting, right? So that is nature, and then imparting that knowledge technology into the uh, the textiles and the garments, and you have uh, non-stain. Um, Water will just won't wet it, and uh, that means it will stay dry, and you have a different type of clothing. And those things have been now further things. You have situations like, okay, I don't have to wash my underwear, right? So non-stain, and it's a, a catalytic effect. So the chemicals are being basically dissociated. So if the chemicals are being dissociated, there is no order. Those chemicals are not there, why wash? Right? So that is the $64,000 question. We are washing because they are being kept, they are not very clean. And if you have the nature's mechanism of keeping things clean, you don't need to wash. So goodbye to the washing machines and the detergents. Right? So then you have a problem of not having an issue with wastewater treatment to a certain extent. So you can see how looking from something nature, then inspired by that, and then you transplant that concept into something physical that we are doing, into manufacturing, and things we take for granted as useful, and then developing a different functionality into the clothing. And here you are now endowed with something very different. And that will e ease your quality, I mean, bring more quality to your life, but it's from, it's a learning from nature, and it will use less resources to somewhat, right? And what is happening with the Salvinia effect? Salvinia effect is now being thought about to be used into paints on marine uh, transport vessels. And one of those the things with carbon dioxide emissions because of the marine bunk oil being used for ships' uh, uh, propulsion. And if the friction is brought down, and then your energy becomes, you need, don't need the same amount of energy, and your carbon dioxide load from the world, the transport fleet, the shipping fleet is going to be much less. And you can see what's happening if you can reduce that friction via the embedding of that uh, the paint uh, on with kind of like the air pockets, right? And that means a smoother sailing, uh, the larger load, and lower friction effects, speed, low carbon dioxide, and probably better for transport. So it's interesting from that observing the salvinia. Salvinia under the microscope. But when you're observing, your mind is prepared for that opportunity. That's the luck, right? Uh, that you are you. Uh, but your curiosity and your interaction with the rest of the subject areas enabling you to move forward. Of course, it's not Professor Gunta who is going with it. With, he has branded it, he has trademarked it, but exploitation will come subsequently by others too. So this is very interesting, right? So you can go into examples like this, how people come in for 10 days in University of Rice, Rice University in Texas, for within 10 days came up with a Nobel Prize winning <coughs> new material, the buckyball for carbon, nanotechnology, carbon uh, nanotechnology. And just imagine the the, the man-made ball and the Buckingham Fuller's geodetic dome and the nature's new creation of the carbon buckyball having a similarity of C60, the kind of the structures. And one scientist was looking at interstellar dust and one scientist was looking at how to create laser and then energy beam and scene. And one, this one scientist from UK wanted to go to USA, spend 10 days and study, can I simulate this process with this new laser? Right, that is interaction. There is interaction and using two different sub uh, subject areas and completely something new coming up and transforming uh, the whole, I mean, the progress of humanity in a sense because nanotechnology is a driving force now. 
right? So you have this kind of buckyballs, and then you have, of course, the curiosity of um, uh, this Russian scientist who got the physics Nobel Prize, right? Who was observing his material science colleagues who were cleaning the metal surfaces and putting those scotch tape under the waste paper basket, and he was collecting those some some of that and then trying to peel off. He learned his peeling off technique, which got him the Nobel Prize from an observation of the material scientist cleaning uh, material samples, right? So it's that kind of rich curiosity that transforms. And graphene is a 21st century wonder material. And 27 European nations have put in $1 billion to study this material. And in Sri Lanka, we have the graphite, which is unique, which is free worlds only, um, and which is ideal material made for this as well, right? So interesting. And how much of we are still selling the graphite at trading commodity prices. So the nature is very much inspiring. And this we have seen with things like even destructive things, sidewinder, the missile came up because some group was thinking what to do. And they were imagining themselves in the desert and saw the reptile's picture coming into the mind. And just imagine that this reptile is following up the heat. That's how he, the, the reptile zooms onto the, the, the victim. And they thought, why not you can do the exhaust heat of the plane and have a missile that is targeted toward that heat. So now we have the sidewinder missile that is thermally sensitive, right? To hitting and I mean, it's of course destructive, but it's a nature's inspiration. You can find so many areas. And that is the subject called biomimetics now, biomimicry, biomimetics, and so on. So the science initially may have ignored nature because we're trying to conquer nature. Today you're trying to learn from nature and to work with nature rather than going against it because nature at the end of the day may prove to be much more powerful than uh, us. But anyway, the situation is why ignore it when it has perfected its systems over a long period. So much to learn and there's so much hidden information. And it's fun learning from it and then probably then bettering uh, in, the, during, in that process. So this is an example of a termite mine, mound being used in East Gaze, Kenya. Well, see, uh, Kenya on a building which is no air conditioning, modern building, learning from the termite mound. How to keep static temperature while the outside temperature is varying. That is what we call as modern air conditioning. But this is how the nature inspired building design. Right? So, um, so we have a huge problem in Colombo with the peak coming up at daytime because of the air conditioning loads and so on. And we know the fossil has been used. So these are examples. This is uh, in Sipa Bihara. So, uh, sorry, this is Sipa. And with our Ayurveda and science, right, why not we make connections? The Indians have gone ahead with the Chitrakoot Declaration where they use the modern tools, the modern medicine, modern science and the, the traditional medicine. Putting three together. And then people are studying um, acupuncture, acupressure, and so on with atomic force microscope. So what the traditional knowledge, evolving knowledge, had been substantial, I mean like supported, analyzed, much more validated with the modern technology. And there's no harm done with using modern science. And that will give me much, much information, right? So we think we appear to a bit like balls apart in these two medicine streams, uh, which is actually not benefiting as a nation, um, uh, which should not be. So this is to kind of conclude, but it's interesting to look at the future economy like new economy, where the nature inspired, and is Gunther Paul's um, the book on new economy. It's very interesting to read. So many nature inspired examples, and mind you, it's talked about 10 years. 100 innovations, just 100 years selected out of us last year already. 100 million jobs can be created, and it's all inspired by nature. So just imagine what more should be out there. I mean, Sri Lanka is very rich in terms of nature, very rich in terms of indigenous knowledge, rich in terms of, there's so much in the 64,000 square kilometers, but it doesn't seem to be really working together to, to learn best out of this the area and what we have to offer. And there's so much of modern tools we can bring in. So while we go about the past, right, when we had the first hospital in the world, and the most advanced toilets in the world, right, uh, at Amradapura. Whereas today, we have to take a serious talk of this kind of current indicators, we are so poor, right? The patent-wise intellectual property, we are not poor, we are, we are quite poor, we are not putting R&D uh, things, we are not even private sector investments are not that high. 
So we have to look at this situation. And why? Because these are creativity driven, but our systems are not supporting the creativity driven ambitions. So we have the, uh, we have to look at, um, say even like big companies like Anita Roddick's Body Shop, which was not marketing oriented in the sense of no, no brand advertising, but she said that she said that uh, she said that her first one of the first products came out from an observation in Sri Lanka, right? The observation of Sri Lankan women rubbing pineapple on their skin resulted in the development of the first pineapple facial wash. Of course, we don't have fine Sri Lankan women doing that as, uh, but pineapple, uh, the rubbing pineapple skin. But the point is, uh, her observation led her to do that, and her all of almost all the products were like observation driven and using indigenous knowledge from various countries. Right? It was not, she was not going for synthetics. She was really looking at the organic range. So you can, you can observation and hear. So this is an observation from us, but change a company or an economy elsewhere. Right? So the, this is the last point of the, the final two. Right? While we have to have the creativity and ideas, we really need to have an ecosystem that enable things. So I think we need to have the Schumpeter's uh, creative destruction coming into, right? To get our circulars and so on to a better footing because most of our systems are so time-bound and restricted, there's no hardly any way of being creative, all right? So there's something to be examined and to address. So that's what the Germans did on Schumpeter's on creative destruction at a very early stage and said, you need to have it, you need to have it. And that was one of the management parts that came in. So we need to have our own creative destruction in some of the parts to get the ecosystem in more dynamic way. Otherwise, are we getting ideas after a while, it become Darwinian evolution of, okay, why should I get ideas? I can't practice my ideas. So finally, there's a real issue in this, in CKDU, and that too calls perhaps for even the social scientists, sometimes it's very interesting the questions social scientists ask, but we, we try to work it, this issue from one, probably one angle of medicine. Right, and uh, maybe that's need to be opened up and need to be solved very, very quickly. That's one thing, right? So this is again called for interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary. So finally, let me say uh, that we need to be creative. And Mundas Kumar took us said this long time back, but uh, this is not what we have been really saying over and over again. The nation which does not create things will not rise, right? So if we depend on exports like uh, the commodities and we want our imports in the way we want is not going to be uh, uh, the, be uh, the future that we want have is the head of us is not that good so it's time to change with putting creativity into the equation putting innovation in place and then ensuring that our ecosystem becomes different so that we can practice so it needs diversity it needs the mixing the diversity in to get that the growth that we really want thank you very much <laughs>